as, as you can tell from my accent, perhaps I'm based in Scotland and not in England where the Liverpool website is based. So I work, I split my team, my time between Liverpool, um, where I write the contents of mostly the HEP drug interaction site. I'm involved with HIV also, and I work clinically in Glasgow. So I have a HIV and um, hepatitis C clinic. So I'm going to look today, we're going to talk about the, treat, the treatment of co-infection patients. So what we need to think with regards to drug interactions in patients who have both HIV and hepatitis C. We're going to look at the added burden of liver disease in these patients. So what do we need to think about if our patients have cirrhosis? And then also just some key examples of, of important drug interactions in both HIV and, and hepatitis C. And I'll try to leave some time at the end for questions if anybody has any, and also make sure we're, we're not late for coffee. So I'm not really doing a case, but I think patient X is, is, is very common to, to, to anybody um, who works in this field. So, so patient X comes to see us, he's on a boosted protease inhibitor and tenofovir and FTC, and they also have hepatitis C, genotype 1B perhaps, and what are the first things as clinicians that would go through our head for treating a patient like this? Well, when we're thinking about drug interactions, I'm going to show you some tables in a second, but these are some of the, the key hepatitis C directly acting agents that do interact with some of the, the um, antiretrovirals. So if we have a patient on HIV protease inhibitors, then straight away we have some contraindicated medications. And you can see the, the three here in red, the, the 3D, the paritaprovir, um, Ombitosphere, the glicaprovir and probentosphere, which is the Mavaret option, and the grisoprovir elbosphere. And the yellow, um, I'll, I'll come to later with sofosprovir, vilpatosphere and voxelaprovir. So Vasevi, there, there's some um, caution with BD darunavir. So NNRTIs, as you'll be aware, um, are commonly inducing drugs. So again, some contraindications here with many of the DAAs. And tenofovir, which I'll touch on later, has higher levels and, and risks to our patients with perhaps underlying venal disease. So when we're looking to start a patient on hepatitis C treatment, if they are already established on antiretrovirals, one of the first questions, I guess, is do you start a, a DAA um, to, to work around the antiretroviral combination of the patient? Or do you take the opportunity to change the, the antiretrovirals to fit in with the first line DAA of your choice? And really, there's no clear answer. You, you can certainly try both approaches. <coughs> certainly in Scotland, we have a, a first line hepatitis C agent that is perhaps the cheaper option. So um, we, we might want to look at changing the antiretrovirals if there are issues with that. Or perhaps it is a good time just to look at, at as um, Say mentioned, simplifying the antiretrovirals to, to go with your DAA of choice. Hepatitis C DAAs and antiretrovirals are largely both associated with drug interactions. So we have to be looking at both sides. You, you can be looking at, at the HEP drug interaction websites and the, the HIV uh, drug interaction websites, but these are, are tables that have been pre-populated just with some of the, the, the amber and red recommendations. So you can see straight away that the protease inhibitors, so our, our patient X was on a protease inhibitor, and certainly that rules out straight away many of the hepatitis C agents. So to move forward for treatment with this patient, you would be looking at a sofosbuvir based option. So sofosbuvir lidiposphere or sofosbuvir vulpatosphere, or, or, or just one of the hepatitis C DA agents that doesn't have a protease inhibitor in it. Either that, or we could consider switching to something like an integrase inhibitor. When we do the drug studies in HIV and, and hepatitis C, again, going back to the, the recommendations on the website, you can see that there are studies done and the, the feedback that we get generally from the website is people see the colour green, they move on to the next thing. They don't need to read the text. Green means go, there's no drug interaction. But we do populate the green areas with PK data. And I think the, the, the fold change or how much 
two drugs cause an increase or decrease with each other is important because it's not one size fits all. So for example, a drug may increase by 40 to 50% and you have a real clinically significant interaction. And we know other drugs, you can have four or five fold increases and, and that's okay. And we can see that here with Maverick um, <coughs> and Genvoya where um, we have up to three, four, five fold increases, but because there's high boundaries, then it's still within the safety limits. However, with Sofosbuvir, Vilpatisvir, Boxolabrevir, Vasevi, we, um, we have lower levels, but we do have a caution. What about tenofovir? So you'll see tenofovir as an amber interaction with many of the hepatitis C DAAs, particularly those with, that contain lidiposvir or vilpatosvir, and that's because of PGP inhibition and you get an increase in tenofovir levels. So if you, we can see from the data here that we have a, <coughs> an increase in the, the Cmax in the area under the curve and the Cmin of 79, 98 and 163%. So if you think about tenofovir and, and the renal monitoring that we need to do anyway, and then you add in the presence of a drug like lidiposvir, then you perhaps may have to do additional renal monitoring. Or again, going back to what Say said about what does an amber mean? How do we personalize that interaction? So does the patient have um, other drugs that may affect renal function? Does the patient already have a low EGFR? Is the patient already on a protease inhibitor? So protease inhibitors like darunavir increase tenofovir levels by themselves. Again, you add in lidiposphere, you have a kind of double boosting effect. So you have two drugs acting on the tenofovir levels. And we can see that from the, the, the European license of Harvoni, where we can see that the, the recommendation says this combination should be used with caution. So if you are happy using Harvoni in a patient on tenofovir who's also on a, a boosted drug, then, then you can do that, but you perhaps might want to see them more frequently um, or, or do a bit more renal monitoring. What about TAF in the, instead of tenofovir? Well, if you use TAF, and instead of T TDF, then you get much lower levels and, and there doesn't seem to be the same problem. So a, a way to avoid the problems with that interaction would be to use TAF. So we can look at the tables, we can select our HIV drug, we can select our DAA, we can look at the drug interactions and we can make a choice. But patients with hepatitis C, often have liver disease as well. And that was the case with this particular patient. When we did the pre-treatment, when we did the pre-treatment workup, I did a fibre scan and the, the level was 27. So we have a cutoff of 12 or more for cirrhosis. The bilirubin was raised, the albumin was low. Um, they were referred to get the gastroenterology who confirmed cirrhosis on the ultrasound. There was no ascites or encephalopathy. Sorry, but if you if you use one of these simple apps, then this patient um, has child's pu B cirrhosis, so moderate liver impairment, and that's really important when we're thinking about treat, both treatment of the HIV, treatment of the hepatitis C, but also all the other drugs the patient's on. So if you look at a drug. Um, any drug study, the vast, vast majority of them are done in healthy livers. So if you also have a cirrhotic liver and a drug that's hepatically metabolized, the effect, the, the, <coughs> the effect of the drug interaction is going to be very much potentiated. So what about liver disease and co-infection? So drug-induced liver disease, DILI, following the initiation of antiretrovirals is more common in patients with co-infection in those with mono-infection, HIV mono-infection. Thank you. Individuals with co-infection who have cirrhosis are at greater risk of drug-induced liver infection. So if, they, if you, your HIV patient is cirrhotic, then of course they're at higher risk. And eradicating the hepatitis C is, is key. You know, these patients need to be treated and they need to be treated as a priority. How do we manage a patient with child's pu B or C cirrhosis? Well, first of all, it's really important 
to know that they can't get any protease inhibitors for the treatment of their hepatitis C. And as I showed you before, there's lots of online apps that I use in my clinic to check the child's pew status of a patient. And it's important because uh, small changes in bilirubin can affect whether patients are sitting as child A or child B, but it does change the license of the drug. There was an FDA warning just issued a couple of weeks ago that says, again, warning about the use the hat, um, of liver injury in patients on HIV protease inhibitors, including child A disease. So these are licensed in child A, but this FDA warning says there is you know, extra caution required even in the child A patients. So why can we not use the DAAs in, in liver disease? So this data, this is the data from studies done of the, the HIV protease inhibitors in child B and child C, and you can see the large levels, particularly in child C, 11-fold, 12-fold, 10-fold increases that's going to be damaging to the patient. But what about HIV? So often our patients have been on antiretrovirals for a long time. Is the antiretroviral the best option for them as their liver disease progresses? So this is just a table of the licensed recommendations of the antiretrovirals in liver disease. And you can see the difference between the use with caution, not recommended, um, contraindicated. So the drugs not on here, which is uh, lamivudine, tenofovir, DF and TAF, they have no restrictions in liver disease. So again, you know, if you're using a back of as a backbone, which is not recommended in child's pew B or C, should you be thinking about changing to other drugs? So it's important to look at the HIV and the hep C. So how do we use the, the PK data to make the recommendations on the website? What is a significant drug interaction with regards to PK changes? So I mentioned this previously, if, if we have a a five-fold increase or a two-fold increase or even a 30% increase, how, how is that significant to the patient? Well, it's important that we understand drugs with narrow therapeutic indexes. I can tell you that a drug might have a 40% increase and it significantly affects your patient. I can also tell you that an antihistamine like loratadine has an eight-fold increase and it means nothing at all. So it's just, again, important about what is the risk of harm to the patient in front of you. And that's really the bottom line of, of what we want to do and get that message across. Is the patient cirrhotic? As I mentioned, there's very minimal data on this. So please be aware when you're treating a patient that, that's cirrhotic, they do need that bit more time. And what's the period of exposure? So the big difference between HIV and hepatitis C, of course, with drug interactions, is with hepatitis C, we have the option to stop and restart a drug. So if there's a statin interaction, can we just stop it for eight weeks and restart it at the end of treatment? Possibly, yes, we can. Again, it's about why are they on the statin, what's the risk? And in, in most patients I've found, you know, drugs like that, it, you can stop and restart. HIV drug interactions are, of course, lifelong in many cases. But some drug interactions, the risk are unavoidable. So how do you manage the interaction knowing that the patient needs to be on both drugs we need to set up a management plan. Perhaps we might need to see them more often. So for example, if a, a drug has an effect on blood pressure, we may need to check the blood pressure more often. Is it a QT prolonging drug interaction? Do we need to give them an ECG? Do we need to do additional bloods? And, and, and that's part of the management of the AMBER drug interactions. So what about some issues with, with HIV? I've just picked out a few things here, and this is, the, the drug injection website, which of course we've seen already. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, <coughs> excuse me, talking about boosted drug interactions in HIV because I'm sure you know lots and lots about them. Ritonavir and cobicistat, they're potent inhibitors and they have lots of drug interactions and there's numerous studies about it, it, from every range of, of co-medications out there, there's, there's issues with ritonavir and cobicistat. But what about the other drugs that are used for in the, the treatment of HIV? So this is um, a look at some of the interaction classes. We've got the boosted drugs at the top where we can see straight away there's more amber and red 
um, drug interactions and, and much less with the integrase inhibitors. But what do we need to know about the, the, the more straightforward drugs? Because there's definitely a move towards a, away from boosted drugs and moving on to thinking about protease inhibitors now as an easier option. So what about the differences between tenofovir, TDF and TAF? So yes, um, less renal issues with TAF. It's a newer drug, nice option, less monitoring. Um, and, and you can see here that the, these, the drugs with the, in amber that are amber for tenofovir are amber because they are renally excreted. And with TAF, they are green interactions. So we don't have the same issues with these drugs. But there are some issues with TAF that you need to be aware of, largely due to PGP. And, and these drugs are green, so no interaction with tenofovir, TDF, but with TAF, they are not recommended or contraindicated, and that's because of induction of PGP. So carbamazepine, for example, is fine with TDF, but it's contraindicated with TAF. So it's important that whilst we think TDF to TAF is less renal issues, less drug interactions all around, there are some key issues that we need to be aware of. What about integrase inhibitor interactions? There's not many, and it's certainly a, a good path to take for, for, for an easier life all round with, with regards to drug interactions, but there are some things we need to be aware of. So, you know, my, this is a busy table, my slides are going to be shared, so, so don't um, worry too much, but there is, there is metabolism, there are transporters involved, and one of the main interactions we see is, is collation with cations. So what about uh, magnesium, aluminium, calcium supplements with drugs like integrase inhibitors? And this is just some of the recommendations in the licenses. So it does appear to be a class effect, but each of the different integrase inhibitors have some slight differences. So from Bictegravir to Dolutegravir to Elvitegravir, slight nuances in the recommendations. So the, this can be an issue. You, you, you do have decreased levels of the integrase inhibitor with these interactions so it's important to be aware when you're advising your patients if they are taking calcium whether they're buying it over the counter or it's prescribed and there's a variety of doses involved depending on whether it's multivitamins or or whatever that that we follow this advice to to make sure we're not affecting concentrations metformin is another drug we're aware of that has issues with some um, integrase inhibitors in this table here. So there's no effect with raltegravir. Dolutegravir metformin has seems to have the biggest increase of 79% and 145 with the BD. Bictegravir appears to be slightly better um, with no dose adjustment required. However, it's an amber interaction as it says in patients with moderate renal impairment, you may have to, mo to monitor the dose. So um, metformin has to be used with caution. And I know um, Say has already shown this table. So lots to think about in, with contraception for, for our antiretroviral patients. So what about thinking about the hepatitis C and, and which agents we choose? So again, are the patients on narrow therapeutic index drugs? This is just a, an example of some whereby the dose is, it's important to look at the dose and the magnitude of increase. The easel recommendations, oh, so it's shut off the bottom, apologies. The easel recommendations um, published in 2018 do say that any patient starting on a hepatitis C agent must have a drug interaction check prior to the, to the start treatment. Um, and I think that that's an, an important, and that includes illicit drugs, over-the-counter, anything at all. This is one of the areas that we get asked most about um, with the Liverpool team, and it's the increasing use of directly acting agents. So DOAX, as opposed to, you know, patients that have been warfarin eyes for many, many years, and they're moving on to these newer agents, and they have many, many advantages, but some of them are, are um, heavily metabolized, and there are issues with drug interactions that we need to be aware of. So we added this table, and you can see here that there are quite a number of amber and red interactions that we need to be aware of with the hepatitis C DAAs. And I'm going to discuss some of them. I'm not going to kind of pick some something out. So we have transporter interactions with PGP, 
again caution in, in hepatic impairment so if you have any increase in in these blood thinning drugs then of course your your patient is is at more risk so how do we manage these interactions and what's the magnitude of increase well again it's a very it's very important to individualize these interactions so how long is your patient on a doac for if it's only a three to six month course can you wait a month before starting them on treatment and then you don't need to worry about the interaction at all. Is it lifelong? Then we do have to think about it. How do we manage the amber interactions? We have this mild to moderate increase of, of the DOAX. Is that significant for your patient? Well, it's, you know, we, we can't answer that on the website. So what is the specific risk to your patient of increased bleeding? So what else do they have going on clinically that would put them at risk? Are they cirrhotic? Is that that may potentiate the interactions? Do they already have low platelets, which of course many cirrhotic patients do? How do we manage the DOAC interactions? So if if you if you don't make a switch, you know, could you think about a Pixaban or fact different factor 10 levels? Or could you consider a switch to either a different DAA which doesn't have the interaction or a, diff a switch to a low molecular weight heparin, for example, to avoid the interaction while the patients are on treatment? So there's lots of different management ways to manage these interactions, but lots of things to think about as well. Acid reducing agents and hepatitis C DAAs is another one that we get asked. So why are PPIs problematic with DAAs? Well, is it is it a class effect? No. So certain DAAs exhibit a pH dependent solubility. So this was the first kind of piece of data that came out that highlighted there may be a concern with this group of drugs. And at um, a pH of two, the solubility of lidipidemia was greater than a milligram per mil. However, at a pH of seven, it was less than 0.1 microgram. So most of the studies were done on omeprazole 20 milligrams and that's where the recommendations lie but what does that mean for patients on pantoprazole or lansoprazole so these are equivalent tables to show you what the, the the similar dose is to the studies done on omeprazole and again we have a treatment selector for is there a better option within the DAA that you want to use elbisvir one of the DAAs that's used in zepatir the NS5A inhibitor doesn't have any issues with drug interactions with pro with um, with PPI, so we want these numbers to be as close to one as possible, and and this doesn't have any effect. Where we do have issues in the licensure, we need to be aware of whether our patients are taking um, PPIs is is with lidipasvir, so we have to separate any antacids by four hours. We can use a maximum of omeprazole twenty milligrams. Um, and it has to be given simultaneously. And it's important to follow these um, guidances because if you separate or increase the dose of omeprazole, you do get a significant decrease in lidipasvir concentrations. And if uh, depending on where you, you live or work, patients might only get one shot at the treatment, their treatment of hepatitis C. So if they fail treatment because they're getting suboptimal levels, then um, <coughs> That's not ideal, and we don't know the, the risk of, you know, perhaps onward resistance. What about Ipclusa, so Fosbivir, Volpatisvir? Well, again, well, this this um, combination has more of an effect, um, more of a reduction than Lidipasvir. So you can see here, um, you know, up to a fifty percent reduction with omeprazole in um, Ipclusa. So again, just checking the drug history of a patient. Are they on a PPI first before we think about anything else? Is it appropriate? Do they need to be on it? So before we even think about drug interactions, can we stop it? And we ha proton pump inhibitors are the most overprescribed drug in the UK. They're, they're, patients have been on it for years. It hasn't been reviewed. So it can be a good time just to stop it. We, we treat over 1,500 patients each year with hepatitis C in Glasgow and at least 300 of them are on PPIs and we just stop them um, and the vast majority of patients and they don't need to restart them. So the advice for Eplusa is, is 
as a kind of stricter advice than, than with Harvoni, the, the combination with PPIs is not recommended. There's then a caveat in the license that says, if you absolutely have to give them, separate by four hours and use a maximum of 20 milligrams. But you saw from the previous data that in some patients you do get that 50% drop in levels. And you can and you, you could think about switching to an H2 antagonist. Maveret, which is glucaprovir and perbrentisphere, um, this is a yellow interaction, and that's because we do get a, a drop, and it's not in the NS5A inhibitor this time, it's not in the perbrentosphere, but it's in the glucaprovir, and you get decreases of 64, 51% um, at using omeprazole, and they studied up to 40 milligrams. However, again, glucaprovir here with 40 milligrams drops of up to 79%. However, um, AbbVie pulled all their, their trial data and they, sh they showed that even with that decrease, patients um, on glucaprovir, it didn't seem to affect their SVR. So that's why we have it as a yellow interaction. Yes, there is a decrease, but it doesn't seem to affect SVR. But they only studied up to omeprazole 40 milligrams. So patients on doses higher than that, and we do see that, of course, there isn't data, so to, to be cautious with those high dose patients. And just to finish off, um, antipsychotics, cutiopine is, is a commonly used drug now in the UK for a whole host of, of, of different um, uh, uses in psychiatry. This is an amber interaction and it's one that, that, that we get a lot of feedback on. There's very large dose ranges with drugs like cutiopine. And this is where we really have to individualize the patient response. So is the patient on low dose, 25 milligrams, or are they on the, the top dose of 800 or even more? The, the interaction with cutiopine and, and, for example, Maveret is mediated by CYP3A4 and you get about a 30% increase. Now, a 30% 30, 30 increase in the vast majority of drugs is not going to be clinically significant. However, and, and certainly if I had a patient on 25 milligrams or 100 milligrams or even 200 milligrams, I would do nothing at all. But if I had a patient who was already on 800 milligrams, then a 30% increase on that will take you to higher levels. If they're cirrhotic on top of that, or we know that cutiopine is a QT prolonging drug, are they on other drugs that prolong the QT like methadone, then perhaps this interaction becomes more important. So it's about looking at, at more than just the name of the drug, what's the dose and what else is going on for the patient before we make our decision if we can co-administer. So the final area where there is um, drug interactions that we need to be aware of that I'm going to look at today is, is with hormonal contraception. And it's ethanol estradiol that, that is uh, problematic in three of the directly acting agents. So paritaprovir, so 3D, um, GP, which is Maveret and Vosevi, are contraindicated in the presence of ethanol estradiol combinations. Where did this data come from? So there was asympt asymptomatic LFT elevations observed and ethanol estradiol containing contraceptions in, in early dose studies. So this was some of the the, so two out of 12 healthy women had LFT elevations and in the lower dose, three out of 14 had grade one LFTs. So it, so at this, this was enough um, data for AbbVie at very early stage just to, to stop the combination. And we don't fully understand why the interaction takes place, but it's contraindicated in their license. So when we're preparing our patients for treatment, what contraception are they on? Can we change it to progestogen only? There's no issues with progestogen contraception. So these are the three DAAs where we do need to be aware of, of what contraception our patients are on. And illicit drugs. So uh, uh, hepatitis C, the, the treatment of hepatitis C, <coughs> we do need to think in many patients about what illicit drugs they're taking. The majority of patients, this shouldn't stop treatment, but there are some... 3A4 inhibitor drugs um, such as fentanyl or amphetamines whereby we, we, we perhaps need to, to tailor the treatment and I'm, I'm not going to kind of go through to that too much of that just now. 
So this is a flow chart we prepared. Again, it'll be on my slides to look at at the end, just to, for the kind of decision-making process when we're managing an interaction. But most of that stems around the management of an AMBER interaction. So just to finish off by saying, we know in HIV, we, there's huge target, targets within 90, 90, 90, but drug interactions link into many of this. So getting 90% of patients on treatment, we need to think about GDIs. Are they virally suppressed? Are there any issues or drug interactions affecting that? And do they have a good quality of life? So is a drug interaction affecting their, are they getting extra side effects to affect that quality of life? So in conclusion, patients with he hepatitis C and HIV co-infection require a drug interaction screen carried out prior to treatment. Individualised care means that you can either change the antiretrovirals or the DAA around what the patient wants. Patients with cirrhosis remain complex and require expert management. And be aware that drug interactions are potentiated in the presence of cirrhosis. Patients almost never just have hepatitis C and HIV, so it's important to look at both websites and be aware of other drug, inter uh, drug interactions that they're on. I think this, the, the final point is the, is the most important, that drug interactions and co-infection, although they're complex, they're manageable. So it should never be a barrier to treating these patients. But, and if you need extra help, then you know there's there's sources to do that. But you know these are the these are the top of the tree patients that we really need to to treat, um, and and manage. So um, hopefully the the websites can make sure that 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 we can achieve that. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was a bit rushed at the end there.